Happy late Easter, everybody. And if you're, say, a St. Louis sports fan, what an Easter it was. This is the sports blog on the Greater STL Sports Network. Robert Bullsby here with you. In today's show, we're going to get to some blues. We're going to try something different, different in the third segment, something new. And then if we get to a fourth segment, just a potpourri of things. But we're going to start off with the St. Louis Cardinals. As opening night was last night, and it involved your St. Louis Cardinals and the Chicago Cubs at Wrigley Field. And as they would say, a rivalry renewed. But this is the type of rivalry you like to see with class and respect to both teams. Even though they might have a bit of rivalry just being St. Louis, Missouri, Chicago, Illinois, right down the road from each other, essentially, state cross-state rivals. But they showed how both teams has class at the beginning of the game as former Cardinal outfielder Oscar Tavares was remembered after he died in an off-season accident. A Cubs great who also died during the off-season, Ernie Bakes, was also honored. Both teams on the field for both of them. So it's kind of nice seeing that in sports. You could tweet me at rbowlsbyjr. That's R-B-O-W-L-S-B-Y-J-R. You can also tweet the network at the Greater STL Sports Network. But let's get to the game. And like we were talking about with Wayne Wright, Lynn, and Lackey in the spring training is when they have them bad starts after not pitching so much, sometimes you just go out there and kind of see where your control is and where your pitch is on so you can work at the next start. And why I'm talking about this is it's kind of what happened to John Lester during his spring training. He actually only pitched in three games and only pitched nine and, third, uh, nine and a third innings through the whole spring training. So maybe this is one of his starts where he didn't have all his stuff. And maybe they were saving him for later in the season when Chris Bryant and comes up and maybe Baez comes up and they both spark the team and they get on a good run towards the end of the season. But it started off right for the Cardinals with one out. Jason Hayward in his first bat at bat as a Cardinal hits a double. Matt Halliday is the next batter and he gets an RBI signal because the Cardinals a one nothing lead. And then in the second inning with first and third and two outs, Matt Carpenter gets an RBI single to get the Cardinals a two nothing lead. And Jason Hayward again came up in the third in his. First to bat as a Cardinal, he left the inning with a double. It led to nothing with the Cardinals. Lead stayed two to nothing. And then in the fifth, a leadoff single from Matty Carpenter. And then Jason Hayward in his third at bat, and the Cardinal goes, starts off three for three in his career as a Cardinal. Matt Halliday with the third straight hit, an RBI single to get the Cardinals a three nothing lead. After that, Holiday and Hayward do a double steal to get runners at second and third with nobody out. And Cardinals couldn't capitalize on the damage as John Lester gets Johnny Peralta to pop out to second. After four and a third inning, John Lester is taken out of the game, allowing the three yard runs, throwing 101 pitches in that four and a third. So it shows you that all his control wasn't fair, like I was talking about. It shows that maybe this is, was just a work at a start. Well, lefty specialist Phil Coke came in. You might know him from Detroit or maybe formerly of the Yankees. He comes in and strikes out Adams to make it two outs. They intentionally walk Yadi Molina to load the bases in that fifth. And Coke then strikes out left-handed batter Colton Wong. So as we move on to the sixth inning, the Carters got to see... Former closer, former teammate Jason Mott, he came into the game and pitched for the Cubbies as he was signed in the offseason. He had a scoreless inning. Rain White then shuts down the Cubs in the sixth, and that was his last inning. And it was a good start in the season for Wainwright to start it off. And shown like I was talking about in maybe his last start, where he was kind of building off something. And maybe a lot, the, a lot of hits weren't really nothing because he's one of the guys to work around it. As there, I think it was four straight innings, maybe five straight innings, where the Cubs started off with their leadoff men on base. And a few of them were doubles. 
Well, Wainwright with six innings, five hits, zero earned runs, zero walks. He did have six strikeouts and only threw 101 pitches. But when it came to the seventh, something looked a little weird as supposed fifth starter, Carlos Martinez, came in and relieved Adam Wainwright. And he kind of looked a little shaky, maybe a little nervous, maybe it's pitching opening day, big scenery for him, something new for him, something he's never seen before. So he looked like he was a little hyped up, throwing a little harder than he should. But when he started to settle down, it ended up being a good ending for Carlos. And maybe that something he can build on to maybe when he moves back to a starter. Because the Cardinals still said Jaime Garcia. And it was reported, as i seen it on Cardinals.com. He'll be doing something within the next two weeks. But it doesn't really say, it doesn't say he's going to be pitching games in two weeks. Well, Carlos went an inning. He didn't walk the batter. He did strike out a batter. It was a scoreless inning. So it's nice to see that from him. Maybe so that it didn't maybe get into his head coming in to relieve somebody when he's been preparing as a starter the whole offseason. Well, that gets us through the seventh inning. We move on to the eighth inning. And after the Cardinals are down in the eighth inning, Jordan Walden, the newly acquired Cardinal, comes in. And <laughs> I kind of like his release. He said when asked if anybody change, could try to change it, he said every pitching coach that's ever talked to him. So it's kind of funny seeing the way he throws a pitch and get, he gets something on the ball, and he he could be effective for us as if Rosie struggles going into the stretch. Well, he went an inning in the, and during the eighth. He walked one. He struck out Castro to end the eighth, and that was a nice outing for him as – it's nice to see him come in and be that guy, that setup guy that maybe we haven't had over the past couple years with Mott not at his best last year, and maybe Carlos reeling from preparing as a starter all offseason and getting to that point. Carlos is shut down in the ninth, and Trevor Rosenthal comes in, and this looked like he was a little hyped up at first, but Rosie settled down, came in, got his inning in. Struck out the side, got the save. So it's nice to see that for him that he didn't come in and had that little struggle, maybe that some people were going to have going in to the first week or two of the season. And it was actually nice to see the whole bullpen, Carlos Martinez, Jordan Rawls, and Trevor Rosenthal do that. Because them kind of pitchers that only pitch that one inning, that arm can get a little soft on you, get a, you know, to where you're not always feeling right when you're preparing in the bullpen, unlike the guys that get the five days off, even though they throw the pitches, the 100 pitches every fifth day. But some of these guys come in and they throw a lot of pitches. So that arm can get a little wore out, but it's nice to see on the first game of the season and maybe the Cubs weren't all the way there. But it was nice to see the bullpen come out three innings of shutout baseball. It was also nice to see that even – with the hits and everything that went on, the Cubs were 0 for 13 with runners in scoring position. So that shows that it shut it down when we really needed to. And in the play where the Cubs had a chance to maybe get something going, Johnny Peralta made a nice play up the middle in the sixth, or in the, excuse me, in the seventh to end that inning. So it's nice to see that the defense is working well and that he looked like he was moving pretty good. He got the ball over there really quickly on a pretty good runner. So it's nice to see that from him. So it was nice to see that Jason Hayward in his first game, probably the start of the game for the Cardinals, three for five. He had run one scored. He had a stolen base and two doubles. Matt Holiday gets you the two RBIs, goes two for four with the walk. Cardinals were three for 14 and runners under the scoring position. And it's the first game. Hey, that's kind of stats that you don't worry about. It was the stat with the 0 for 13. That's nice to see the pitchers doing that. And hopefully the Cardinals can get better with the runners in scoring position. Because you're not going to get this every game from your starting staff. And I said that last week, when, or last podcast, when I said that when the starting five came in and had that .114 in their last six starts to show. So, so you, know, you, you want to start getting going with runners in scoring position and stuff. But, you know, this is the kind, you know, you're not going to get it every game. And then. You know, it's nice to see that they had 14 runners in scoring position. That means, you know, they're getting on base and getting in scoring position. 
The Cardinals also had four steals. So they were getting running. You seen Peter Borders come in in the eighth inning to be the spell to Halliday, be the guy to go out there, and he stole the base. He ended up getting the third that was in the eighth inning after the Holiday walk. So he didn't score, but it was, you know, he went out there and showed that what he's here for. He's here for the lightning speed. And, I mean, it wasn't a like it. It was a all that bad of a throw. I didn't go that far out, and he got the third on it very easily. So it was nice to see that from him. It's also nice to see Wong get out there and stole a base. Crumpner attempted one. He missed. Hayward stole a base. Halliday stole a base, which was on a double steal. So obviously they were, if they were attempting to throw anywhere, they were going to throw down to third. So it was nice to see that from the Cardinals on a pitcher that they know that doesn't throw to first base. So you try to get runners in scoring position every way you can. Definitely in a game where Ross isn't the best catcher and Lester never throws the first. So it was nice to see that to start off the season for the Cardinals. Cardinals do return to play tomorrow as they were off today. Lance Lynn will start against St. Louis and Jake Arietta. And you're hoping Lance Lynn builds off them two starts, you know, with the 12 innings, only two run runs allowed in his last two starts. So the Cardinals. You're hoping this is what you get through the season is good pitching and then the hitting from Hayward, the RBI from Holiday. And lend your horse, your horse, he's going to be your second guy this season because of the injury to Walker. They're probably not going to push Walker too hard this season. So it'll be nice to see what we get tomorrow from him as the season starts to get it going. And then all the left headers, instead of facing a left hander, all left handers in our lineup will get to face a right hander. Um, Mark Reynolds did get in the game. He got an out. He uh, think he pitched it for Carlos Martinez. So you didn't really get to see much of the bench except for Bohr just getting the stolen base. So early in the season, you probably won't see much of that. They're going to try to let the stars go as far as they want deep in the games if they can do it. So it wasn't a really big spot at the time where he came in. There was a runner in scoring position, but, you know, things happen. But you hope that the, the Cardinals can build off these type of bullpen things, too, with Carlos maybe going to that fifth start, the starters role, and start the season off right here as we go through Chicago and get to Bush Stadium. All right, we're going to take a break here. We're going to get some Blues hockey next. This is the Sports Blog on the Greater STL Sports Network. Hello and welcome back to the Sports Blog and the Greater STL Sports Network. Robert Bullsey here with you. You can tweet me at rbullsbyjr. You can tweet the network at Greater STLSN. That was a little bit of a long segment on the Cardinals. We're not going to do that on a single game every week. It was just kind of fun to get the season going. Kind of miss baseball. It was a little hard to fill that little whole segment with just one game, but it was. It's kind of good to get the get the season starts to get going and get down the stress here in the hockey season, as it's just sports time fun for St. Louis. So we'll get to the Blues now. And the Blues played on Friday night against the Dallas Stars. And as we have been talking about the last two weeks, 
since the Minnesota Wild game, how Elliott, as he's played more games, it seems like, he has kind of fallen off a little bit. And then Jake Allen, is he's getting his time in there now as Elliott's not playing that great. He's starting to prove what kind of goalie he is. And what a game. It was wild on Friday night as Brian Elliott was in goal. The Blues did win, and the score was not a hockey score. This was actually a good baseball score, a defensive-worthy football score. Seven to five. And this was a game where Ken Hitchcock joked both teams played well on defense. And as we know for the Blues, the turnovers and stuff, the defense hasn't been playing well. But you don't like Dallas. Also, you could tell, didn't play very well. As the Cardinals did get on the board first, as Patrick Berglund, one of the guys we were talking about that needs to get going, as the Blues get on a stretch from the guys that are out and Steen and Tarasenko, Berglund put his 11th in for the season. McCulloch with the assist, his eighth on the year total with the Penguins and the Blues, and back is with his 31st. Now in the second, after the Dallas came and scored two, Berglund did score his second goal of the game for his 12th of the season. Shettenkirk with his 33rd assist. And another guy that needs to get going that we don't mention as much. He's a third liner. And uh, that third line hasn't been producing all that much this season. So we kind of we kind of skip over him as we were always looking at Berglund. But it would be you asking who was only his fifth assist of the season. So it's another guy that has to get going. And then Schwartz scores again for the or Schwartz scores for the Blues to put them up. His 26th of the year. TJ Oshie with a, his 35th assist. Bo Meester with his 10th. And for Bo Meester, you're not really expecting him to for the points, but the way he's been playing defense this season and getting the retarded penalties that he's been getting throughout the year, you have to get something from him. And it's at least he gets an assist in this game. Then the Dallas goes on a four-goal run against the Blues to take the lead of 5-3. So this is just a back-and-forth game to where you can tell that the defenses are kind of maybe playing all-star game defense to where they're just letting the shooters go in, wind it up, and get it past the goalie. Well, after that four goals with Dallas led 5-3, Jaden Schwartz scores again to put his 27th of the year in. Assist from Petro, his 37th. Shattenkirk, his 34th. Great for a guy who's missed a lot of time this season. To Shattenkirk to be up there near Petro, who Petro, who's more of an offensive guy, and Shaddy's more of a back-and-forth guy, a two-way guy, to have 34 with the time he's missed. Well, after the... Four straight goals for the Dallas Stars. The Blues go on a four straight goal run. As McCulloch puts his second as a blue in, his fourth on the season to tie it up. Oshi with his 36th assist. Bumeister again with another assist, giving him 11. So it was nice to see that right there from the Blues. And then you get Petro Angelo, who gets a goal. And it's nice to see that from him as we we're just saying his offensive prowess to get in another goal. His goal was unassisted, so it sounds like a turnover for the defense for me for the Dallas Stars. And then Schwartz gets the hat trick, and he scores his third on the empty netter, and that gives the Blues a 7-5 to win. Now, there was 32 shots on goal for Dallas, so a lot more shots than Elliott has faced in the later games this season. But he only saved 27 of them. So, again, the five goals allowed is something you can't have. When I, As I said, he had nine over his last 53 shots against him. So, 
that's showing that maybe that he's taking the number one a little too hard now as we're going down the stretch. Because if you know going down the stretch in the later years, Bruce were always fighting to go maybe make him the number one guy over to Halak as he was playing the big minutes down the stretch and being one of the best players on the ice for the Blues when they needed to be. And it wasn't always injuries in the playoffs. When he, Definitely when he was in the game, or excuse me, it wasn't always the goalie in the playoffs. Definitely when he was in the game. But it was, you know, the injuries that the Blues got and the goals they couldn't score. So for Elliott, that's 15 goals against in his last 85 shots. That's a really high number for a for your number one goalie. So there's something that you're going to see as we go into the next game the Blues played. And it was a big game where this number one spot for the goaltender thing has shifted. And we'll get right into that game that happened on Sunday night on Easter. And it was just like the St. Louis Cardinals. The Blues were playing their cross-state rival at the United Center in Chicago. And the Blackhawks. The Blues, be, coming into this game, had lost six straight games to the Blackhawks, being outscored 23-7. to So if you lost this game, this goes into the playoffs as the Blackhawks just own you, and there's no way to get past it. Now, another thing that Hitch did again, as I've mentioned before, he switched up the lines again. It's something the same people can't get chemistry with. There are certain lines if he keeps doing that. Well, maybe this is this team that just likes playing together and they don't need the chemistry. Maybe they already have the chemistry that is needed. As the lines going in this game is Backus was actually moved off the first line, replaced by Stasny, centering Schwartz and Oshie on the line, on the wings. Backus centering the second line, Jokinen and Berglund were on the wings. Oh, excuse me. Yaskin and Berglund were on the wings. Jokinen was on the third line. Laterra centering. Raddy on the other ring. Then you had Ott, the usual fourth line with Ott, Gott, and Reeves. Well, Jake Allen was in goal, and it started off for the Blues with David Backus scoring his 26th goal. It was on the power play, assisted by Schwartz for his 34th, a guy that has played well all season. And it's nice to see that from him getting another assist. And that's a guy that already had his career high in points coming into this stretch before that. And he's still building up the stats with the hat trick before. The, and now getting an assist on the first goal of the game with Backus, giving him 61 points on the year. Career high before that, I think, was 55. Shattenkirk, another assist in a game after he was plus three against Dallas. First goal of the game, power play. Assist for Shatty. And that tied back is for 10th all time power play goals in Blues history. It was his 10th power play goal on the season. Career high, so it's 10 to 10. That kind of works out. That now puts him in the top 10 in games, goals, assists, points, plus, minus. Like I said, he was tied for power play goals and also in the top 10 in shots. So that is an all time. Great blue right there. It also tied him for 10th in the all-time lift. With, that was his 50 career power play goal. So he's moving up on these lists. It's, it's coming around, and he's still kind of young. I mean, some of these hockey players play to 40. So he's still got a long way to go. If these injuries don't affect him going on, and the way he plays doesn't affect him. Well, Chicago did tie the game against the Blues. But then Ole Jokinen scores his first of the blue. Ty Ratty with the assist. Petrolando with his 38th assist. So it was nice to see that for the Blues. To see another guy that doesn't get a lot of playing time come in, get the goal, make it 2-1. to one, And that is his first goal as a blue. And it was also the game-winning goal. This win pit the Blues first in their division with three games left. 
lead. They lead Chicago by three, one point up on Nashville. And it was also their first regulation win at the United Center since February 3rd of 2010. So it's been a long time for the Blues. And like I said, when you had to come down the stretch, you needed to prove to these teams that you can do the things that you haven't done against them before and win games and win at the, off the United Center for the first time in five years. Now that's just crazy to even think about. Howland in the game became the first rookie to win at the United Center for the Blues since December 28th of 2005. It's almost 10 years since the last time a rookie goal goalie won at the United Center for the Blues. So even another crazy thing. And then Jake Allen is the one doing it. Since the new year, he's did 10-1-2 on, on the season since the new year. He's 21-6-4 on the year, 10-3-3 on, on the road. And in that game, he had a season-high 38 saves. So it's nice to see him being effective going down a stretch. And now I think he's the, taking over this number one spot. How could you get away from him? And it kind of goes now as we come into today, if you heard Ken Ash like last night saying he wasn't even going to go there, Jake Allen was going to get the start in the next game against the Jets. And what Hitch, all Hitch had to say on that was that I'm going with the hot hand. Well, your hot hand should be your number one goalie right now, and that's Jake Allen. But as we go back to the assist, it was nice to see that Ty Ratty got in on the action. It was his second career assist in his nine career games in the NHL. And he has been a top player in the NHL in the last two years. This year, he's playing 59 games, 21 goals, 21 assists, 42 points, a plus seven. Last year, in 72 games, 31 goals, 17 assists, 48 points, or plus five. So a guy that's been playing very well for you in the AHL now gets his chance, and it's nice to see him get a assist on that third line, get the and on the game winning goal. So maybe that gives him a little extra thing going down the stretch, and maybe you have him as one of your healthy scratches going into the playoffs, unless the Chicago Wolves are going to the playoffs. I mean, and it, I mean, does it really matter if he's in the playoffs? In the AHL, if he can maybe get a shot, just in case Stig and Terry Single get hurt again, or maybe someone else gets hurt, you got a guy, another guy to back them up, other than just maybe the older guy in Yoke, and then you got a younger guy in Ty Ratty. But what I kind of wanted to do to finish this off is kind, and I was, I talked, said I was going to talk about it in the last podcast, and I got, I ran a little late, and I was talk about. The guy we kind of gave up on when we signed Brian Elliott to that one-year contract in 2011, and that was St. Louis native, graduate of Chaminade, Ben Bishop. Now, we gave up maybe, and what I'm saying is maybe you could have groomed the hometown kid. Maybe you could have kept him around and you could have found maybe a second guy to go under a lot. Because you knew Halak was going to be your guy. Now, and this was in Peoria, and this is for this is for the Blues when he was here. In his first season at Peoria, he was 15, 16, and 1, 2, 8, 1 goals against, 8.91. The next year, 09, 010, 23, and 18, and 4, 2, 7, 7, 9, 01. 2011, this is his last year before he was traded. 17, 14, and 2, 2, 5, 6 with a 9, 14. So you see in them three years, he was getting better as it went on. Now that last year, the 17, 14, and 2 doesn't sound all that great, even though his goals against were lower and his save percentage was higher. Now Elliott did play pretty well, and it was also in the NHL when he was in Ottawa. The first two years, 08, 09, and 09, 010, he was 16, 8, and 3 in 08, 09, 2.77 goals against 902. That one shutout. 
Oh nine oh ten, he was twenty nine eighteen and four two five seven with a nine oh nine with five shutouts. Now getting to the season where that uh, Ben Bishop had in the AHL with the seventeen fourteen and two, and that he was in the NHL that season and played a total of fifty nine games. Brian Elliott did. And then 2010, 2000 was 15, 27, and 9 with a 339 goals against and an 893 play percentage. Now, I don't see how you could, when your guy that you brought up that's in your system that you drafted that's from St. Louis has much lower than that, even though it was in the AHL, almost one goal less a game. And how you could give up on him like that to a guy that didn't play that well. And was traded from the team that drafted him to Colorado. And we did get Brian Elliott for a really good deal, 600000 on a one-year deal. So, I mean, that's cheap for a guy that, for a backup goalie. Now, he did come in that year, in 2011, 2012, and just blow away everybody. He holds all the Blues... Goalie records are from him from that year of 2011-2012. But we did only sign him to a one-year deal. So we'll go back to Bishop's 2011-2012 for Peoria. He was 24-14-0. He led the AHL with a 2-2-6 goals against and a 9.25 save percentage. So even though Brian Elliott was playing lights out in the NHL that year for the Blues, Ben Bishop played out lights out that year for the Peoria Rivermen. Now we did trade him to the team that Brian Elliott lost his job to, to where he was traded to Chicago and the Ottawa Senators. So he never really proved it in the NHL. He only played a career 13 games for the Blues. He went 4 5 and 1, 2 9 4 goals against him one year, 2 7 6 in the other year he played for the Blues with an 8 9 3 average save percentage. So that was the same that Ben Bishop had in his 2011 year, but in a lot more games than, when, than in the four years that Ben Bishop was in the system for the Blues playing the 13 games in the NHL. Now, since he's come on and been a starter, these are the kind of stats that you kind of want to see from your goalie. Ben Bishop is 37, 14, and 5 in 2014, 2013-14 season. He had a 223 goals against with a 924 save percentage. Now this year, he's become just an elite goalie as the season has ended yet. And he's tied his career high with 37 wins, 13 losses. Five overtime losses. His goals against is a little higher, 236, and he has a 914 save percentage. So it's, it's kind of different to me to see the St. Louis guy who could have been here and could have been your top goalie because in the long run we picked Elliott over him and now we picked Elliott over her lock, even though we gave up a lock for Ryan Miller. Maybe the St. Louis can, could have been that guy and been here with the other St. Louis and Paul Stasny. And now you got a real promotion to get to the St. Louis crowd. Now, I know that really wasn't the Tom Stillman group, and it really wasn't Dominic Armstrong. It was the guy that went to Columbus, and I can't really remember his name right now. But that was a guy that I think you, you would have, could, have, could have kept around and built something off of. And maybe the guys that seen him as Shaman I play, the coaches and stuff, maybe you get more people going to the Blues games because you have a St. Louis feel. Now, I know it's difficult for a lot of people to play at home, and St. Louis players that play here have said this. It's pretty difficult to play for your hometown team because you always want to be great for your hometown team. But I just wanted to kind of compare that and give you a kind of a different thing to look at other than looking at Jake Allen and Brian Elliott, and go back maybe a little farther to the St. Louis Ben Bishop and Brian Elliott. Well, that's going to do it on the Blues for this segment. We're going to do a little something different here next, right here on the Sports Blog on the Greater STL Sports Network.
And welcome back to the sports blog on the Greater STL Sports Network. I'm Robert Bowlesby. You can tweet me at rbowlesbyjr. You can tweet the network at Greater STL SN. What I'm going to call this segment is a little hometown rundown. What this segment is kind of going to be about is I'm going to kind of go and look at the independent teams. Maybe some of the teams that we can go support. Well, maybe we can't afford to go support the Cardinals in the Rams and the Blues every game. We can support some other teams to help build the sports for around this area and maybe help some people out that really need help out, like independent businesses, the mom and pop stores, mostly the sponsors at these games that can't really afford to get themselves out there, but get themselves out there. And also for the players that are trying to, you know, Maybe make it to the NFL or the CFL or something bigger or, you know, the MLS or something like that, the Major League Baseball. So, well, let's a little just run down some hometown things that are going on around St. Louis. And we'll start it off with the indoor football team, the St. Louis Attack. And the Attack played their first home game this season, and they play at the St. Charles Family Arena. And they played the River Grand Valley Soul on Saturday night. And they lost that game. And I had, I had to score, but it was, I think it was 63 to 40. It was 60, yeah, 60, I was, I had said it right here. Sorry, the Tech lost 60 to 43. And the crowd at the Family Arena was 4,034 fans. So it was kind of a nice showing. I think you can only fit 10,000 in there. So it's kind of a nice showing for an independent football team. and. You know, it's kind of nice to see them. And for a team like the Attack, they brought a lot of St. Louis people in to play for the teams. I, when I was looking at the teams, there was a lot of Hazelwood grads. Uh, do you remember Zach Abron from Missouri? So it's kind of cool that they're giving the people from a chance from St. Louis to come out and play for them and get seen on the map. Now, the Attack did win their first game to put their record 1-1 one one after their loss at home in the earlier part of the season. There's only six games left in the season, so make sure you get out there and support one of the hometown teams. Now, the Attack had a little trouble passing in the game as they went, they completed 39% of their passes while Rio Grande Valley completed 78%. So quarterback Mac McMillan had a little trouble, but you'll probably get over it as he was ex-league offensive player of the year. And he was also top quarterback in the ex-league last year. And you, the attack should be better as time goes on as they were in the ex-league championship last year. Now they do play again April 11th against the Bloomington Edge, and it is at the Family Arena. So be nice if you go check them out. Another team that also plays in the family arena and are affiliated with the St. Louis Attack are the St. Louis Ambush. And their news for this season, and it's pretty good news, is Darren Duran returns as their head coach. And it'll be his 14th se season coaching St. Louis professional stock soccer. And Mr. Duran is a legend in St. Louis soccer. Kind of like the McBrides. And he's been in St. Louis soccer since 1982, playing for the Steamers, playing for the Storm, played for the Ambush. He came back to the reincarnated Steamers, played to 05 until he retired. And he's also became a player coach with Ambush when he first started with Ambush in 1992. So it's nice to see that, too. St. Louis also bringing in. Soccer legends, another thing for St. Louis folks to look at, like, oh, man, we could go see Daryl Duran. And they also give a lot of the St. Louis kids a chance to come out there and show their things and maybe get into the bigger leagues. The Ambush will play in the newly formed Major Soccer, Major Arena Soccer League, and their play starts in the fall this year. Now, we're going to stay on the soccer tip. As it's kind of good for St. Louis as we're trying to build this stadium up as a football stadium, a soccer stadium that's going to be on the riverfront in St. Louis for the Rams. So some soccer games were played 
in Missouri in the past week on March 31st at Arrowhead Stadium. Mexico and Paraguay played to a 1-0 Mexican win, and it was attendance of 34,114, and it was the first soccer match at Arrowhead since 2010. And it was also a way for KC to officially enter itself into a 2016 Copa America Centero. It's a 16 tournament where U.S. and Mexico get automatic bins. So they already have kind of a soccer repertoire with Sporting KC. So they're trying to get games to come also to Arrowhead. Something that the Cardinals have done with Bush Stadium. And this game at Bush Stadium was actually with the women as the national team for the United States play the New Zealand woman, New Zealand woman, U.S. won four to nothing, and it was a record-setting crowd at Bush of thirty-five thousand eight hundred seventeen. St. Louis native Larry Chapini scored in the game in the forty-six minute after being subbed in. She was also named Woman of the Match. So it was nice to see that, that a St. Louis native got in, got the score, named one of the match in her hometown. And from what I've seen on Twitter, she was posting pictures of her going to Ted Drew's. So a nice treat for her in her hometown. She gets to score in a soccer game gets at Bush Stadium, of all places. Not many girls get to play there, so it was probably a big stage for her in her hometown. Now the crowd was the largest crowd to watch a standalone women's game. For the national team in history, it was the third largest crowd for a national women's game and friendlies matches. So that's kind of cool to see St. Louis come out and support soccer when we have kind of preached for years that we would be a good soccer town, almost as good as we'd be a good football town. And they showed it with the record-setting crowd. And this is something to build on. To get that MLS team, they can look at this and say, wow, they're going to show up like this to a women's soccer game. Imagine they would do to a major soccer event if they have their own team. And then you could go with, hey, we would have a rival on Sporting KC. And now you could have home and home matches at Bush and Arrowhead. Or even a, what's that, a Kauffman Stadium. Or something like that, just to play in different stadiums. And, you know, I don't think the Rams would be too unhappy if the Cardinals played one game a year, or Cardinals, if a St. Louis soccer team played a game at Bush Stadium once a year. And maybe it's just a friendly, maybe it's a friendly before the season, you know, a preseason game for soccer, and they just play against each other just for fun of it, like a cup, like the Governor's Cup, like KC and St. Louis does in the preseason sometimes. So it's kind of cool to see. The Cardinals are the soccer being supported when we need the stadium to keep our football team. And that could be a big swing for the NFL to say, hey, if they can do this, that's going to bring us MLS team there. That means they can support the football team. And then MLS can look at this and say, hey, we, we're looking to expand. And this will be a good city to expand to. So it's kind of nice to see something different and try to get, you know, maybe another major sport in the St. Louis area that other people like and can support. All right, we'll move on to the River City Rascals of baseball. And they'll start their season on May 8th at TR Hughes against the Frontier Grays. And it should be a good season for the Rascals as they're returning their whole infield. And it's after a season which they were the runner-up in the Frontier League Championship. So... It'd be nice to see, you know, something different. See players that, you know, never you never know. Cause you could see in the major leagues one day from St. Louis and all around the United States playing right here in your backyard, no foul. So as it goes on and we get a little more, I would have got more stats from the attack game, but they weren't up. So as we go, if it goes on, this segment will get better. We'll have a little more stats. We'll see who's playing well and who has a chance to maybe come up and go to things on better. But before we get done, I wanted to talk a little bit about this national championship game, and that's Duke versus Wisconsin. And uh, first time in a long time, Duke has been an underdog, is in their 
ESPN's rating, whatever they rate it, has, Wisconsin has a 64 chance percent of winning. And I never really watched a Wisconsin game before, 